So as we think about all of this that's going on in, in, in our world and, and the distractions for some, right? In the midst of all of that, what, one thing I pointed out uh, that was so, so clear is that these people around the world were prepared to become followers of the Queen, even in her death. These people were prepared, as it were, to become disciples of the Queen. You saw young and old, blind and those with sight, wheelchair-bound, crutches. People could hardly walk being pushed in wheelchairs. What was driving them? They were determined to go and see the Queen. And as you listen to the testimonies, and God bless them for their, for, their, for their memories of the Queen. And you know she's been here, what, five times in the Bahamas? I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember that, but I was. I remember as a little boy being on Fort Charlotte, and uh, I ain't going to tell you all when, because you all going to call me old. Um, in my little red shirt and blue pants, it was my, my two brothers and, and, my, and my cousin who was raised with us, the four of us, I still have the picture today. We were on Fort Charlotte with our little flags and having our good time and whatnot and whatnot. And then uh, when her grandson and daughter-in-law, grand granddaughter-in-law were here recently, my brother and my sister got to meet with them and we were like, well, okay, this is cool. It's good, it's cool, right? I mean, it's okay, it's all right to meet royalty. I mean, look, uh, we, we, we go crazy meeting our Bahamian royalty, right? <laughs> you tell people, oh, I met, I shook, I remember a gentleman told me he shook Sir Lyndon's hand. And look, I thought, I thought he, I, I thought the fellow was going to fall out. I think the dude was like, woo, hey, you, you all know what happened to me? So we have that experience and nothing wrong with that. But when you look at it, these people were so driven by a common belief in one person that they got out of bed ailing. <coughs> I gun. I can't see, but I can find somebody who could take me. I can't hear, but somebody can do braille. I can't walk, but I'll borrow a wheelchair. It may take me four days, but I'll leave five days ahead just in case. But I'm going to London. Driven. By one passion, I gotta go see the queen. If you ever heard an example of a disciple, that was it. They stood up to 22 hours in line, weaving. Y'all think when we go to the airport, we have trouble with them little line and thing. As a joke, these people were there for 22 up to 24 hours. No fussing, no fighting, except the one crazy one who decided when he got in the hall, he's getting a rustic acid. Well, boy, did he ever pay a price, right? <laughs> and he gave a court tomorrow, on the morning, right? And trust me, he's on lockup today. Trust me, he has thoughts and all arrested. He can't even think, right? But these people were driven. <laughs> driven by one person. One person that galvanized the attention of the world. So much so that you all realize that according to the news, ain't nothing else happened in the world. You all realize that in the last 10 days, right? I think Putin was the only one to interrupt things because they found when massive grave two days ago and they had like two minutes out of our news. Yeah, it was two minutes of that, the rest of his queen. Here, everybody wanted to get in line. We gotta go sign the book. Nothing wrong with signing a book. I just want you to understand. People were driven by one person. Today, I want to challenge our hearts very quickly before it gets too warm in here. I said that before, hey. Um, but that's okay, because summer, but listen, this summer was hot. Yes. <laughs> summer was a scorcher, right? Still hot. It can be hot till December, so you may as well. Ain't no point to complain about heat, right? But I want to challenge our hearts from a very uh, focused, um, very familiar passage of scripture. I'm also trying to get your attention. Um, I feel all that for him. <laughs> Found in Matthew chapter 16. I want you to 
Take your Bibles, and even if you can't see it, put it on your phone, you can see it there. I want to compare our desire to follow Jesus as we have seen in a live and direct way of how people were prepared to follow the Queen. Young man, is this still the recording? Okay, there, so I need to stay put then. <laughs> I, I, I have a bad habit. I like to walk and talk when, when I speak. And so I have a hard time standing still. And, and in this, and, and, in this and, and boy, God could not have given us a more real example that everybody could relate to <laughs> than right now. And that's the beauty of God and how the Holy Spirit works. But he says this in Matthew chapter 16. We'll be beginning at verse 24. He was having a conversation with his disciples. And, 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 and that conversation led him to, to challenge his disciples by saying this. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For, what's, for whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. Father, as we share in your word in these few moments, we ask, O oh God, that you would enlighten our hearts, enlighten our minds, and I pray, God, for clarity of thought as we share. And challenge us, Lord, challenge us today to, to look hard and see where our allegiance lies. We bless you for the opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, very quickly then. And so this, this, this conversation that Jesus was having with his disciples was in preparation for his death. He was trying to get them to understand that I am going to die. I'm going to leave you. Fast forward, we know that Peter, got, Peter being the, the, the fris, frisky, feisty one, among the disciples, got up and said, no, 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 uh -uh. no, no, Jesus, no, we ain't having that. You are not going to die, and which resulted in Jesus saying to him, get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> What's important to recognize in this passage is Jesus wasn't calling him Satan or suggesting that he was controlled by Satan, but the idea that you could stop the death of the Son of God, Amen. which was the will of God, Amen. meant that you need to recognize where that thought came from. Because the will of God will always be accomplished. Satan will do his best to disrupt it, but he says, I want you to know that what you said, I hear your passion, but you need to put that back where it came from because you think that you could stop the will of God. That's, uh, you're serving the enemy with that statement. Which means this, we must be careful what we say in the heat of passion because it could cause us some problems down the road. God, Jesus Christ recognized that that idea was against the will of God and the plan of God. And so he told them, get that devilish idea out of your head and go back and pay attention. Today, we live in a culture, in a post-Christian culture. I want to recognize that because at the end of the day, this, this whole idea of following Jesus is so subjective. When the word of God is objective about what it takes to follow Christ. We live in a culture where we believe that being a Christian is just about being on easy street until Jesus comes. And there is nowhere in the Bible that teaches that. Because Jesus said himself, in this life, those of you who follow me, those of you who choose to come after me, he says, in this life, you can have some challenges. It ain't always easy. But he says, don't worry about that. Why? What was the promise? He says, because I've overcome all that. Which means this, you and I have no worry about when the trials come, because they will. When they do come, we have the assurance and the confidence that the same Jesus that promised, that said, I've overcome that and I will be with you, I am victorious in him. But let's move forward very, very quickly because it's getting a little warm in here already. And so Jesus began this statement with a two-letter word that says, if a man or woman comes after me. Suggesting what? We have a choice. Because if you're coming, here's what's required. Huh. Now, <laughs> let me throw shade here for a second on all of us. People stood in line in the cold 
and in the rain. Some of them didn't even realize they needed to bring food, right? But they wasn't man or woman enough to get on the line to go get food, because for fear that they may lose their spot. You realize some of us wouldn't sit still in church for two hours. I want us to, to think about what we see happening with this last week and see how committed people are and then parallel that to us in our relationship with Christ. Anyhow, so he says, if you come in, which means that we have a choice. He says, if you decide to come after me, there are three things I'm going to ask you to do. And most times when people quote this verse, you know, we realize we start with take up your cross and follow, right? <laughs> That's the part we remember in this verse more than any other part. But then we miss the most important part, which says you must do what? Deny, Deny yourself. Now, let's make it clear. Denying yourself and self-denial are two different things. Okay? Because you could deny yourself, you could self-deny a little ice cream and a little sleep and all those other things for a time and go, oops, go right back around. Or you could deny yourself, you could, you could do self-denial and, and give up a meal for the day and feel good about yourself. And then the next day you eat three times the amount of food because you gave up the one yesterday. <laughs> But Jesus said, you must deny yourself. When you deny yourself, you say, I lose all rights and privileges for the cause. Amen. Big difference. Yes. I give up all. In fact, I treat myself as if I didn't exist. That's what Jesus said. That's what's going to be required if you're going to follow after me. Why? Because it means then that I have committed myself not just to giving up who I am, I am prepared to move self off the throne, as it were. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, we, we know this from the word of God that <laughs> self has always been the problem. Sitting on the throne of life. And we want to negotiate everything with self on the throne. Jesus said very clearly, if you're going to come after me, you and I have to be prepared to take self off the throne and let me occupy are we prepared to do that? Those people in London and from all over the world, and you saw them from every creed, <laughs> every color, every make, every model <laughs> was there. They denied themselves some things, right? Mm -hmm. By the way, for you to be able to go start in line for 24 hours, you'd miss work. Mm -hmm. And some other duties at home. <laughs> and some other duties in ministry. <laughs> You have to miss a lot to be able to go and stand in line. And in order for you to stand in line for 22 hours, it means that you'd be there for at least two and a half, three days, which means that some things didn't get done. Jesus said, the biggest battle that we're going to face in this life is to get self off the throne so that I can rule as I ought to. Yes. Yes. If you're going to come after me. Amen. You see, we can't expect this to be interpreted as our own selfish holy will of God. Now you know there's a little oxymoron in that. Selfish holy will of God. And some of us are good at that. Because we still negotiate with God. What can be? Self. So then he says you got to get self off the throne. And make sure that you understand that you give up the right to determine. Because now you're following me, which means that I am the one who's going to direct you. We have to be prepared to get self off the throne. Because we know this from Galatians 5, 17, that the two most powerful sources in life are the flesh and the, the spirit. Huh? And what does, what does Paul say about them? They are contrary. Contrary don't mean this. Contrary means that. And as long as self, the flesh is sitting on the throne, we are going to act, talk, and behave contrary to what the Spirit of God wants us to do. So he says, requirement number one, that we must be prepared to get self off the throne. Removing self from the throne, therefore, is a key to following Jesus. When we have self 
when we treat self as if we didn't exist, then Jesus says, I have, now I could work with you. Because you've emptied, remember that, 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 that um, phrase we used to like to use, we have to empty ourselves and fill it with his presence by the Holy Spirit. So God wants us to do every day. Every day. Secondly, he says, therefore, if you're going to follow me and you take yourself off the throne and allow me to occupy the throne of your life, he says, then you, you've got to take up the cross. And so what does that mean? Are we seeing all this time, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for... We don't like to say, we sing that. But wait until the cross gets on our shoulder. Then it's a horse of a different color. A song with different words. Taking up our cross means then that we must learn to love what Jesus loved and hate what he hates. We must remember that the same Jesus who we follow, there are going to be times in our lives when we have to go through the same experiences that he went through. Because Jesus laughed, but he also cried. Jesus felt fear and anxiety. We know that from his experience in the garden. He, he felt shame. He suffered. He died to sin and himself and to the world. Are we prepared to take up those crosses of such and follow him? As a matter of fact, we, we, we see in, 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 in the verse 26... It says, it speaks to those who, he says, for whosoever, 25, for those whosoever will save his life shall lose it. In other words, there are many of us who can tiptoe through life, avoiding all, anything that requires more of me. Let me show you how we do that. You sit down to a table with strangers and you're scared to pray for the meal because you don't want them to know you're a Christian. You, in the office... In the conversation, you know you ought not to be uh, in that conversation. But then you stay because you're too shame. Because if, st if you step away, you can feel embarrassed. Because in stepping away, you're saying to them, I don't want to be of that. I don't want to be in that conversation. Same difference. We see it every day. We go, to, we go to work. And I've asked this question before. We go to work and there are people who would be shocked to find out that you and I are Christians. Why? Because as long as we've been there 10, 15, 20 years on the job, they still don't know that you are a believer. Why? Because you're shame. Hmm? We're scared. Because of what they may think of us. Well, what did you think they thought of Jesus? In fact, they thought he was a lunatic. They thought he was a heretic. They thought he was blasphemous. They thought and they thought, they said, you know what? You need to do it. Huh? Because he was not afraid. In fact, when he said to them, I am the son of God, they said, oh Lord, he done now. He finished. This, this, this man crazy. Finish. But yet here we are, can't pick up that cross to be identified. You remember Peter in the courtyard after Jesus was arrested. <laughs> and the girl say, hey, 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 you was with him? Me? <laughs> No kidding. No, brother. No, sister. You, you got the wrong man. No, uh, uh. Somebody, I, I know that you think there's two good looking men around here, but this is not one Amy. <laughs> so she look again. She say, no. And as he spoke, she said, no, no, you can't fool me. Your speech betray you because you talk like one of them. Now, how much? <laughs> Seriously. We, some of us, Jesus knew this. He said, this is why I want to tell you before you come. Some of us like to hide in the bush of life, hoping that nobody ever sees us. In private, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Come to church, we lift it up and we want dancing here. But let him open the door. Whoops. Woo-hoo. No. Jeez. And people can see me, man. Young people, if you come into Christ for, save, uh, for salvation, if you, can, you, if you have enough to trust God for salvation, you ought to be able to trust God enough to let people know I'm a believer. Amen. And I don't do those things. I don't drink. I don't smoke. And I don't run with those who do. I'm sorry. I ain't saying I'm better than you. That's just not what I'm called to be. Yeah. Got to learn to do that. That's part of your cross. 
Jesus knew what it felt like to be shamed, to be spot upon, and to be beaten up. In fact, you know something that's amazing? We live in a country where nobody's threatening us with a gun because of Jesus. And we're scared. We live in a country where nobody's threatening to come here and burn down this edifice because we came here on a Sunday to worship God. And yet we're scared. <coughs> we live in a country where ain't nobody standing over us with a, with a sword ready to chop our head off by the name of Jesus. And yet we scared. Lastly, we live in a country where we say we are a Christian nation, where 70% of the people still go to church, and yet we are scared to be identified with Jesus. That's not a cross that is easy to bear, but Jesus said, if you're coming, you have to be prepared to bear it. Amen. Some of us wouldn't go out in public and our t-shirt that says, I'm a proud member of the Michael Community Bible Church. Praise the Lord. Sorry about that, brother. Some of us don't do that. We'll come to a church event in it, but we ain't going out in it. That's your cross. That's your cross. We have to be, I mean, just like these people who stood in line, they risk catching pneumonia. They miss some of them. They won't go to the bottom so bad. It's like, boy, thank God when they put them bottles all out because it felt like if I move, I can lose my space. I cannot do that. I've come too far. But look how far God has brought you. Yes. And yet you're still scared. Anyhow, my last point. So, so some of us then, Jesus said, if you're coming, be prepared to carry that cross. Because here's another cross that's going to come up. You and I can't run hide in the bush because this, this, this conversation gets hard. Because yes, abortion is real. Don't go hide. God has a standard. Speak the standard. Same-sex marriage is against the order of God. Don't run in the bush and hide. Speak truth to power. Okay? Marital rape. They better define that in God terms. Don't run and hide. Speak the truth. We do not, in, under any circumstance, support abuse and manipulation of anyone. But by God, you and I better be prepared to stand up when these same fellows who say that they have been elected to lead us defy the word of God just to be included? You better pay attention. Don't go hide in the bush now. Because on that day, when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, guess what? Everybody can know you as a Christian idiot. And then you know what they can say? Well, why y'all ain't tell me? Y'all got me here standing and at the great white throne judgment, being judged by God, when you had an opportunity to tell me that Jesus says, but you was too scared. Hmm. Hmm. Think about it. Because there are going to be some people that you and I love standing in the other line. <laughs> Think about that. Remember... The rich man and, 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 and Lazarus, right? <laughs> Why not a rich man would give up everything he had? Just to. Just a tip. Think about it. If you're coming, Jesus says you're going to have to deal with that. Gender neutrality is garbage based on the word of God. God said, I've made them male and female. Well, who changed in that? By the way, don't get it twisted. Men have been trying to change the order of God from day one. But God is God. He is sovereign and requires no counsel from us. Okay? So we need not be scared. Okay, it may cost you your job, but Jesus said, look here, see that crow and that bird, that pigeon, I take care of them. You think I can take care of you? And if it costs you your life, what you lose, and you're going to be with the Savior, you ain't going to worry. But that's part of the cross that we have to carry. So when these conversations start up, you need to get out of the bush of life and stop hiding. 
And don't try to change the subject. Everybody want to talk. Don't talk about the weather when we want to talk about biblical things. No. Uh-uh, we ain't talking about that. Me, I am interested in how your children are doing. No, we are talking about the principles of the Word of God. You and I better decide which biblical values are we going to stand on and stand on them. Because you're going to be tested. Lastly, Jesus said, <clears throat> follow me. What does that mean? So we deny self. We take up our cross and we follow. What does that mean? Then? It means then that uh, to follow God, to follow after Christ, means that we must be prepared then to live as he would have lived and has lived. We, what does that mean? It means then that we should live in humility. We should live with compassion. We should live with a sense of love. We should live as if we are grace receivers and grace benefactors. We should live a godly, virtuous life. So it means to follow those people who stood in line, hundreds of thousands of people, prepared to stand in line and wait because they were driven by a value of what the queen meant to them. <coughs> well, last time I checked, last time I checked, two things were certain. The queen was created by God. <laughs> yes. eh? yeah. And the queen, therefore, was never, she's been described as many things to many people. Thank God for that. But one thing she was never described as, savior of the world. Yeah. Ha! What happened, y'all going, y'all going away? Huh? Y'all, y'all just, what I just said? She was described as many things. And thank God for that, because even you, when, 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 when your day comes and we lay you out here, some people can get up and say some things about you. I don't know if it's true or not, because, you know, we lie at funerals a lot. But, you know, somebody's going to come and say some things about you. I hope they're true. But one thing among all the testimonies about the queen, and again, thank God for her, but ain't nobody ever described her as a savior. It means then to follow Christ, we must be prepared then to be proclaimers of the salvation of which we partook and the life-changing experience we are having in Christ under the power of the Holy Spirit so that we are enabled to share our faith with others. That's why he said you are salt and you are light. That's why he said you let your light so shine so that men may see, see, that men may see God in you, in the things you do, Amen. and they will glorify our Father which is in heaven. Yeah. I challenge you today, I challenge you today, examine our loyalty to the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we prepared to come after him? Many of us are born again. But many of us have still not made up our minds to move self off the throne and allow God to occupy that throne and allow the transformative work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to change us. Many of us are still tipping toe around the issues of life to avoid a, having a cross to carry because we don't want it. We want the bed of roses part of, of following Christ. We want the blessing of following Christ. As a matter of fact, we are preferred to chase the hand of God rather than the face of God. Many of us are still not prepared to live as Jesus lived by following him because we, some part of us still wants the benefit of the world and the blessing of God, and they do not go together. We want the best of God. Well, I'll tell you, the last part of verse 25, I close with this, says this. And whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. You know what that means in simple terms? When we wrap ourselves in Christ, as opposed to tiptoe and trying to save our life and save our this and... No, no. He says, when you wrap yourself in me, and I in you, then you'll find the true purpose. You'll find the happiness you're looking for. You'll find the contentment that you're seeking. You'll find the success that you're seeking. 
He says, because outside of me, while you're dodging and trying to save you and trying to pinch there and trying to figure out which part of my word you're going to obey, he says, you will not find those things there with me. But it's only when you lose your life. In other words, when you give your life totally unto me, Jesus said, then you'll find it. Then and only then you'll find it. And so I ask you today, I encourage you today, as we have seen this live demonstration of what commitment is, and what it looks like over one person that God himself made. <laughs> I ask you as believers in Christ, do we have the same level of commitment to our Savior? And he is still alive. Do we have that level of commitment? I challenge those of you today who may be here. Maybe today you've never ever placed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Today is a good day to start. Yeah. Those of you watching online, you'll never get another day because tomorrow is not promised. Mm. Right. But today could be the day yes. that changes the course of your life. Because today <laughs> could be the very day that you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And Amen. make today that day. Yeah. Yeah. And so I invite you to stand with me as we pray. As we give God thanks for his word and for the living example of what commitment is. I pray that each one of us would examine ourselves. Examine ourselves. Examine our commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Where we have taken ourselves off the throne. We are prepared to take up the cross of Christ and to follow him. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you. Oh God, we thank you, Holy Spirit, for your the way you've moved in our lives, showing us through this very live and very uh, real scenario that's taking place around the world. God, I pray that you challenge our hearts today. Challenge us, oh God, to examine our faith walk with you. That we have taken ourselves off the throne. That we have taken up our crosses as we ought and that we are following you. <laughs> Change hearts, God. Seal your word to our hearts today and draw those according to your Holy Spirit to your saving knowledge today. And today, God, we pray for King Charles and his siblings and his family. Yes. God, oftentimes we forget that in the midst of all of this, yes. they mourn the loss of their mother, yes. their sister, their grandmother, their aunt, their friend. And God, many of us who have lost loved ones understand what that's about. And yet, yeah. today, we lift them up in prayer. Yes, God, I pray by your divine province that in this yeah. whole interaction, God, that you would place someone in their midst mm -hmm. to share the simple gospel of the Lord Jesus yeah. Christ. Yes. Because no matter their human royalty standard, they too are a soul that needs a Savior. Yeah. And so we pray for the protection of our Prime Minister and all those who have gone. And we know the burden of security is heavy, but Father, we pray to the one who has his eye and his hand on everything and everyone. And as they move to go to New York in the coming days, God, as world leaders, we know that you have set the agenda. And we also recognize, too, that man has his own. Superintend, even in those meetings we ask of God. We bless you today for your word and for our fellowship. Continue, Lord, to meet the needs of this, this congregation as you have divinely ordered. And we bless you for that. Whether it's healing, whether it's relationship healing, whether it's financial healing, psychological, emotional healing, relationship healing, God, you move as the need exists. For your benefit, for your glory, we give you thanks and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.